going on everybody welcome to the houston ensemble podcast we're here with the legendary lynn seaton this is an episode i'm excited by we were just talking before we came on this is the first bass player to join us on the podcast it's long overdue i'm super tired of talking about guitar (laughs) and everything else no i'm kidding (laughs) but um for me this is special and um i'll just start with this first time i ever saw you in person lynn was when i was a freshman in high school i w- got a little scholarship to go to the jamie abersole jazz camp and you were there and i was not one i was not at all invested in jazz it was primarily classical at that point but it was kind of cool for me to go out there and uh get a taste of what was going on and um another person that we had on Corey christiansen was my combo teacher at the jamie abersole jazz camp and we got to speak with him but i just remember watching you one day at a master class taking a solo with the bow which nobody else was really doing there and i remember the 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 magnum sheath for your bow Uh, i don't know if you still use that but i just that stuck out that stuck out to me and i was just totally blown away so thank you for coming today this is awesome and you made an impact on me a long time ago so now you're here well i'm honored to be here i'm really honored to be the first of the low end to join your conversations here so I'm glad you literally decided to stoop so low. <laughs> Master uh, of the bass frequencies. That's what <laughs> it but it's great to know that the Abers Old Camps had an impact on you. Yeah. They are, have been around a really long time, and Jamie's got it down, man. It is widely known that the tobacco and diet industries lobby governments with scientific propaganda for years until proven guilty in court. The artificial treatment of our water is the next corporate deception. For example, virtually every nation in Europe has rejected the use of artificial fluoride. International studies since the 40s have repeatedly shown that endocrine and neurological effects increase after repeated consumption, even at the levels accepted by U.S. government. Epic Water Filters is the most thorough industry-grade filtration system that Houston Ensemble has ever used. They reduce heavy metals upward of 99.5% such as lead and mercury, bacteria like E. coli, and poisons like chromium, nitrate, and fluoride. Join us in our journey to living a toxin-free life and get your epic water filter using discount code Houston Ensemble lowercase one word. That's Houston Ensemble lowercase one word for 20% off your epic water filter. I have the greatest respect for him as an educator, as an organizer, as a person and all of the educational materials that he has put into the canon are phenomenal. Yeah. So is the is the camp still going on? The camp is not going on this year. Okay. He retired officially a couple of three years ago and then decided to do it one more time and then was going to do it with the COVID hit. And so I don't know what will happen in the future, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm, that's the, the, mm, but he retired before the everything started going down right in the world like yeah. right before that okay yeah well see the way my introduction for lynn would have been like this it's been it's very simple i met lynn and i knew within a microsecond that he was one of the cooler ones <laughs> And that's it. And it's just obvious. And you you just talk to him, and you know. And uh, also, he had a ferocious spirit to him, uh-huh. unlike other musicians there, in my opinion. And I respect that because some people say that I have that, and maybe that's just something I recognize in other people. But I don't know. Whatever the case may be, um, Lynn, tell us your side of the story and maybe a few details that we may not know about lynn but should when you say my side of the story do you mean like the history of my life yeah the 
the history of your life, <laughs> the key points, and maybe some lascivious, lascivious stuff. I don't know. Whatever you want to get into. Okay. Well, there's 12 keys, so I'll try to keep the points to 12. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, sure. I was born in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was a product of wonderful school training. Um, I started playing actually classical guitar when I was seven years old and then went to a music store in my neighborhood called Sade Music, which amazingly is still in business and took my first lessons there. When I was nine, I went to the band room at my elementary school when they said, today is the day if you want to play an instrument in orchestra, come down and they had they don't call it a petting zoo then but that's basically what it was you go down and look at all the instruments and i wanted to play bass possibly because of paul mccartney and probably not understanding that he did not play upright to my knowledge but it didn't matter but i wanted to play upright but i was actually pretty small for my age in those days i've since caught up obviously but they said why don't you start on cello and i'm like no i want to play the bass so now it is much more common to have half size instruments in schools and availability but then it was pretty rare but Tulsa Oklahoma had a fairly large music program so they found a half size bass for me and I started on that my father built me a couple of little stools to stand on little short risers basically one for each foot so that I could get up taller and then they had a stand to hold the bass so I started that way, went through the public schools, music program, the orchestra program, all of that. Uh, started taking private lessons at some point. And then in junior high school, we had a stage band, they called it. And I played electric bass as well around that time. And I did play in garage bands, first on guitar and then on electric bass. But I've been in garage bands since probably eight years old, playing with my friends and jamming, you know. Uh, the stage bands in junior high and high school got me introduced to large ensemble jazz music to some point, you know, I mean, we weren't a legendary jazz program. There really wasn't one in my school, you know, but we did play and rehearse with a large ensemble, you know, it was great training and I was in orchestra. I did all city. I did all state orchestra that sort of stuff. I did go hear some bands play that came to town, you know, Kenton and Buddy Rich, things like that. There was a music scene in Tulsa, so my parents took us to some concerts there, a classical orchestra, took us to some jazz concerts. There was a Starlight Jazz Series in the summer that was outdoors, and I got to see quite a few local jazz players there, who became my later teacher, Jim Bates wonderful bass player still an amazing beat in tulsa i mean what a beat he's the cat that's been working since the 60s you know does orchestra he plays in the symphony he does all the jazz gigs all the shows monster bass player but lives a wonderful life in tulsa you know hmm. so quite successful so i got to see him play and other people came through town i auditioned for and got a scholarship when i was in high school to go to a summer workshop that Stan Kenton ran. So that was so far over my head, I was really lost. But it was some great exposure, you know, to get to see the band live. They had just hired, you know, some wonderful young players in the band. So it was really an amazing time. I got to meet some people and it changed my life, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty amazing. The new drummer they had just hired is, was named Peter Erskine. Mm -hmm. He went on to great, great, great fame. You know? So John Worcester was the bass player. And he happened to be from Dallas. And anyway, I obviously met him at the camp and told him I'm from Tulsa. and said, oh, we're going to be in Tulsa coming up here in a little while. Um, we're playing actually a private event let me ask Stan if you could come. <laughs> so he said, talked to Stan and Stan said, yeah, sure. So it turned out that it was a private event at the Petroleum Club, the hoity-toity joint in Tulsa downtown. So 
He said, you got a suit? Yeah, I got a suit. He said, we'll show up and we'll have you come in with the band and we'll figure it out there, you know. Stan loves having young people hang out with the band. So it was great. So I went to the gig. They invited me in and he said, we've got to find a place for you to sit. So he went and talked to Stan. He said, oh, come here. And he literally grabbed a chair and put it in the band right next to him. <laughs> so I'm sitting on stage with the Stan Kenton Orchestra. Going, oh, my God. So I think that had a huge impact on my, me wanting to play jazz and saying, I want to be a part of this. Just, it was an amazing experience. So I'm eternally grateful to John Worcester and the members of the band for allowing me to do that. And Small World... Uh, People that were in that band included Jay Saunders, who was our lead trumpet teacher and ran the two o'clock at North Texas for many, many years. That Stan Kenton workshop also had Dan Hurley as one of the teachers. So it's amazing, small world, you know? Mm -hmm. So from there, I went to the University of Oklahoma for a little while, played a lot of rock and roll all my life, a lot of blues. Um, but I really started getting into jazz. I liked through the blues. I liked the swing feel and the jump beat, you know? So I was part of a rock band called z -Back, which was popular in Oklahoma. We had a circuit. We ended up playing, you know, four or five nights a week in different small towns each week. Purcell, Halls Valley, you know, Oklahoma City, whatever it was, Norman. And we did that for a while, and it was a pretty successful band. So I saved up my money and realized I really wanted to play jazz and decided I should leave the band and really start trying to practice. And I got together with some friends and formed a quartet. Well, actually, I was a bass player. I didn't really get to form it myself. But uh, three other people, Morris Nelms at the piano, Stephen Fulton on trumpet and flugelhorn, and Rich Thompson at the drums. And Stephen was really the leader of the gang of four. But we had a band called Olio, and we made it our mission to try to learn standards and play. I lived with Morris. We shared a couple of different apartments. And we had a rule in the house, if you wanted to play, practice, or listen to music, that took precedence over anything else that was going on. So if you were trying to sleep and somebody needed to practice, sorry, they would go practice. So we jammed a lot with that group. It was an amazing time. I also moved into, for a while, actually right after I left z -Beck, the rock band, into a, the garage of a friend of mine who had the garage apartment upstairs. I'd saved some money playing with z -Beck and decided that's when I'm going to start my first heavy practice time. So the season was mild during the spring. I took my bass out of the case. I set it next to my bed. I mean, it was a double garage, so I had a couch had a TV, had a phone, all that. It was really like an apartment. It just the doors were garage door. But it was That's a nice awesome. place to live. But I left my base out, so I had to climb over it and made myself practice. Mm. And that was my first big practice time, and I started getting some things together, you know. It helped. So after playing with the Olio group for a while, um, I went to visit Cincinnati, and my sister lived there, and my brother-in-law, and two huge things happened during that summer visit one i went and sat in at the blue wisp jazz club with john von olin at the drums and steve schmidt at the piano mm. and had a wonderful time and felt a really strong connection so i gave him my card and said hey if you ever need a bass player i'm looking to get the heck out of oklahoma at some point and they said thanks you know figured that's the end of it two weeks later Schmidt called me and said, are you serious? We actually are going to make a change in our bass player. The bass player we had is great, but he's busy doing other things and has to miss a lot. So here's the deal. It's not much bread, but it's steady playing jazz with some world-class players every week. We were a house rhythm section, and there were guest soloists every week, probably twice a month, two weeks of the month. It was nationally known soloists. People like Herb Ellis in the guitar world, you know, Jimmy Rainey, Cal Collins, since we're talking guitar players here, you know, amazing number of people, but great horn players too, Charlie Rouse, Bill Berry, I don't know, the list is amazingly long. When I look back at it, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I got to play with all these people. 
But that was my real school. And we also had a big band. And I didn't start doing the big band right away, but a few months later I became the bass player in the Blue Wisp Big Band. And that's where my first jazz records were made. Mm. Through the connections there, through a wonderful pianist, uh, I got to play with all these incredible people. Just amazing, you know? So I got an offer later because of the recordings we were made. They were passed around the Woody Herman bus. And Phil DeGregg, a wonderful Cincinnati piano player, mm -hmm. uh, was an advocate for me. He was on Woody's band. And he left by the time I got the call, but I got the call to go out with Woody. So I was talking to Von Olin. I said, man, why am I going to go out on the road when I'm playing jazz? five nights a week with world-class famous people. But Ron Olin in his wise sage wisdom said, well, you know, there's certain consistency you get when you go on the road. And it's like, okay. Because he'd spent a lot of time on the road, you know, also with Kenton, with Woody, with you know, Ralph Martieri, incredible drummer, and a huge influence on Jeff Hamilton. He didn't know that. So, that was my first road experience. And through that, I met Dennis McCrell, who recommended me to Thad Jones, and I got the call to join the Count Basie Orchestra. Mm -hmm. Spent a couple of years there and continued to tour, and that expanded into more world touring. And it was incredible. Uh, with the Basie band, we backed up several legendary vocalists. Nancy Wilson, Joe Williams, and that led to some gigs later on down the road working with Joe in different places. That was a really fun, obviously, there with the band, but also I got to do several weeks at Joe's Pub in New York after I moved to New York. And Diane Schur, which we recorded an album, which won the Grammy. Very exciting thing to happen. Plus, I got to play for two years over 400 gigs probably with Freddie Green in the rhythm section. Ridiculous. Amazing. So that was a dream come true. It, during all this, met my wife, Mariana. We got married, decided to move to New York. Uh, moved to New York. I had a short tour, about two and a half months with Tony Bennett, and it was a good time to move to New York. And through Tony's piano player, Ralph Sharon, when I moved to New York, he knew that George Shearing was looking for a bassist to do a few months with, and he set up an audition, one of the few times I've ever had an audition. And I went to George's house, and George was, at that point in time, mostly playing duos with bass players. And he'd had Andy Simpkins, he'd had Don Thompson, Neil Swainson, Steve Wallace, quite a few people playing duo with him incredible duo players you know so i went to his house but i've been playing big man exclusively for over three years you know you get one solo a night maybe but i didn't solo then like i do now but i definitely had a good beat so he loved my beat as a matter of fact he said we were playing and after the first tune he was here when he says you're a real ding dong daddy ding dong ding dong ding dong mm -hmm. so is it okay if we call you that uh, when it's out of the video? <laughs> Whatever you like. But anyway, so that's how I got that. And that was a great way to come to New York because I moved to New York and I, it turned out that he had a three-month gig at the Cafe Carlisle in the winter. So it was a really great way to come to New York with a gig. So I was very, very lucky. So I've been freelancing ever since then, made a lot of records. Uh, been on over 125 things that actually got released. I don't know how many that never got released, sessions or demos and that sort of stuff. Um, the, in New York, did a few things, jingles and that sort of stuff. Not a lot of it, you know, but a little bit of it and that kind of thing. Toured a lot. I spent 16 years, at least six months a year on the road. Mm. Uh, Long-term gigs that I had after that included uh, well the longest gig after that before i came to texas and continuing into texas was jeff hamilton's trio i spent 
couple of years before that with Monty Alexander and his trio. A few different drummers, but the one record we got to make, or I got to make with Monty, Duffy Jackson is on drums. So, and Paco Greer from Columbus, Ohio is on hand drums. Mm-hmm. So I've played with lots of people. i played every state but Alaska, so if anybody here has a gig in Alaska, man, I'll almost do it for expenses. I don't <laughs> want to lose money on any gig, but I can't believe I've never played Alaska. That's been crazy. in 35 countries or more. Some of them several times. Wow. Um, is that what you were asking? Oh, uh, and, uh, no, I was just course, saying that's funny. Just Alaska. Yeah. Well, go ahead and ask it. So, um, somebody it, that somebody that we know. I, it's funny you said Alaska because the other day I was just talking with somebody who's from New York, booking music, who's a friend of ours, and you're like, "We're going on tour to Alaska, but just Alaska." And I was like, "Wow, lucky you." Um, yeah. I was going to kind of bring you back into Cincinnati. Can you remind me what years it was when you were in uh, Cincinnati? Moved there in 1980 mm-hmm. and moved to New York in 1986, I believe. And were you, te- were you teaching at the university there during that time? I did a little bit later. Yes, I taught at CCM. Cincinnati Conservatory of Music within the University of Cincinnati. Okay, and cool. I did teach there after a, some time. Yeah. Wow. And um, did you ever did you ever get to go to the Performing Arts High School in Cincinnati, SCPA? I don't recall. Yeah, that's that's totally fun. I was just curious. That's the I went to a high school down there, um, just a Performing Arts High School and it's really great and there's a great uh they have a wonderful jazz teacher there his name is erwin stuckey i'm not sure if yeah you, you know great. erwin stuckey i know reputation yeah yeah he's a cool guy so there's just a lot of stuff what was what was your favorite memory of cincinnati culturally like kind of besides the music part well that was my adopted home so mm. I felt like I had become myself, you know, That's cool. as a person, as a player, I began to find my own voice. I have some very dear friends that I'm still deeply connected to, even though I don't see them much. Uh, it prepared me for urban life. Mm. I had a scene where I lived in a loft at downtown at 308 East 8th. Oh, cool. One of my roommates who owned the lease to the loft was Eric Wolfley, who is now the piano tech at CCM. Hmm. But in those days, he worked for Harry Garrison and did a lot of freelance work. And Harry Garrison owned the player piano shop, which was literally next door to the original Blue Wisp Jazz Club. Hmm. And he's the one that moved a piano in that made the Blue Wisp Club possible to be a jazz club. Wow. Pretty amazing. So we had a 5,000 square foot loft, but the lease was for a piano repair shop. Oh, wow. So it used to be a print shop. It was 5,000 square feet of open space, except for the little tiny rooms that some were permanently built and some like my first room were built out of the inside cardboard tubes out of carpet rolls and then foam core board, which of course only go up about eight feet. So not a lot of privacy except for visual privacy. But man, it was a great place to live because we had all this space and we had great pianos. And Eric had built a soundproof room at the other end to demo pianos near the freight elevator. Oh, wow. and that's how we got up. Literally, the elevator would open up, and you had to pull handles down, and you're in our place, you know? Wow. And same with every other. There were artists and other floors. There was still a printing business in the bottom floor, but the top floors were other artists, visual artists and stuff. So it was a cool scene. And, you know, they hadn't figured out this part of town yet that needed to have regulated parking, so you could always find parking because there was nothing else going on around there, you know? Wow. It's so it was a great scene. And it's changed so much, even in the past four years. It's like a totally different city almost. Yeah. 
And um, one cool thing is that when I was, you know, kind of a freshman slash sophomore in high school, um, one of my friends was like, you, you play, do you play jazz? And honestly, I don't think I knew what I was talking about. And I think I just liked it enough. And I was like, yeah, like a little bit. I'll play like in a middle school or, you know, beginning big band, whatever. And uh, my first ever jazz gig, we'll call it, was at the Blue Wisp. Yay. And it, they they were nice enough, actually, to have kind of like a high school combo from the performing arts high school start off Saturday night just from like, you know, six to eight or something like that. And that was one of the most just momentous times for me going there every weekend, every Saturday night, learning tunes and I, I'm afraid of what it, what it would have sounded like in hindsight because honestly, sometimes <laughs> I was like, this is pretty good. <laughs> um, but Which location was that? This was on, um, it's not the original location. I believe it was the second location. Oh, why am I blanking on the street right now? Was it on 8th Street? <coughs> no. Okay. Um, was it down the, in a basement? No. That was, wasn't that the original one or was that like the no, second? No, the original one was actually in O'Brienville. It was on Madison Road. Oh, okay. Actually, I don't know if I knew that. Yeah. Oh, man, I'm blanking well, on the street. They, they ended up for a while being in a location literally next door to the loft that I used to live in. Oh, wow. Literally next door. But that was I remember it now. It, it was on Race, Race Street. Oh, yeah, right, right. And yeah, uh, right. it's now totally closed unfortunately yes but they have they have opened up actually a few more places um there's one that's kind of doing really well it's called cafe vivace i was there yeah for you were there memorial service for von olin yeah uh beautiful place yeah and there are like a ton of really wonderful musicians coming out of cincinnati i have a lot of friends who are still there yeah they're just like smoking absolutely cool i agree I'm sure you also, just real quick, give us your, your rundown on Skyline. Did you try it? Did you <laughs> like it? I still love Skyline. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, it's great. And fortunately, uh, I didn't talk about my leaving New York and coming to Texas, but some of you may know that I teach at the University of North Texas. But fortunately, one of the grocery store chains here is Kroger, which is yeah, based yeah. in Cincinnati, yeah, owned yeah. by Federated Department Stores, and they carry canned Skyline chili. Yeah. I also have spent, even during my time in Cincinnati, working on our own version of homemade Skyline. So, That's but cool. But it, it, for those that may not be familiar with it that are listening to this, it, Skyline is a type of chili. Now, some people that are diehard chili say Texas must be Texas red. It is not that. It has the same name, but it's... Uh, influenced by other cultures supposedly greek mm -hmm. and it has a wonderful flavor some of the unusual ingredients for chili include chocolate and nutmeg and other spices you know from the middle east that you might not expect mm -hmm. but man the flavor is amazing they serve it either over chili or over little hot dogs which they call conies and it's it's a wonderful flavor. It's an amazing thing, but yeah. you can't judge it by a bowl of Texas red. It's not the same thing. It just shares the same name. No, but I, some people get it together. It's its own thing. Yeah, it, it, but it's an amazing flavor. It's so good. And the cheese is also a very important part of that as well, because yes, they is. kind of have this unbeatable shredded cheese <laughs> that goes on top, and you're just like, whoo! There's With a lot the of world's good food. finest <laughs> graters. Yeah. I mean, little, it's the greatest so small. Not to be confused with Grater's Ice Cream. Right. There you which go. Which is another, another Cincinnati Institute. <laughs> Institute. Oh, man. That is a... Go ahead. How start? many more years you got left at uh, UNT? Lynn? I can't spell retirement, so I don't know yet. You don't know yet? Yeah. Okay. We shall see. I, I got you. As long as I get great students yeah. like you that inspire me to want to teach... I'm happy to be there, you know, that, but I really don't know, you know, I haven't set an end game with any permanence. 
things well, are I evolving. appreciate you saying that things are evolving obviously um there's two faculty members myself and rosanna eckard who have been serving since 1998 mm -hmm. but that means we are the most senior faculty as far as serving there we're not i'm not necessarily the oldest amazingly enough yeah. but, but i am longest serving along with rosanna yeah so things change you know to totally a random question sure um you lived through 1999 being the the great cataclysmic foreseen cataclysmic year right before the end and then you went through 2012 the the next one after <laughs> that and i'm just wondering was was there this is so random i know but was there any point at the turn of the century that you had any any inkling of of doubt or worry about the state of the world i just wonder about that well if you're first referring to the millennium changeover and all of the computers crashing yeah and all that stuff if you're referring to that yeah i had more faith in the people that designed the computers to understand <laughs> that the digital numbers can turn over i know that my car continued to work after it zeroed itself out mm -hmm. so i i wasn't too worried about that okay I mean, yeah, do I have my concerns about the state of the world? Yes. Yeah. You know? But. Well, that's kind of what I was sneaking into here, obviously, but um, it really depends on you how much you want to comment. But uh, if there are any, uh, do you have an observation? I would like to keep it more about, more music, about music than politics, if you don't mind. Oh, no, not even politics, no. But um, uh, we, we were wondering about some of the new developments at UNT because I left at a point in which there were some massive changes uh, just structurally in the school going on. Can you talk about that a little bit and how your experience has been with that? Well, of course we have new administration and we have several new things down the line into the jazz program. We've expanded our faculty. We have several junior faculty members that have brought a lot of great things, new ideas, new methods to update what is there. So that's very exciting. A uh, couple of things that I really am proud of as far as what school is doing includes having a jazz strings program. Oh, They've hired cool. Scott Tixier, who's a monster, monster violinist and fine teacher and they started this jazz strings program we had a little bit of a string thing going on back in the day craig butterfield was a ta and oh, yeah. he, he is a marvelous bass player but one of his, he actually started this jazz strings thing there for a little bit you know but then it kind of disappeared for a while and then Fortunately, it's there full time. We have a full time person. We also have um, commercial music elements coming in. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be searching in the fall for a full time tenure track commercial music person. Mm -hmm. We have more expanded, you know, improv faculty. Mm -hmm. We, it's a lar much larger faculty than when I started. It's still one of the largest full-time faculty. I mean, there's, yeah, some of those other schools in major metropolitan areas have a list of faculty members that's as long as your arm, but mm -hmm. a lot of them are not full-time from mm -hmm. full-time, you know, lecturer to tenured people or tenure track. So we're very lucky. We have a lot of support. UNT is just a, you know, since speaking of bass, UNT is just kind of a monster bass school all around, classical and jazz. Yeah, my and classical I'm, counterpart, Jeff Bradetich, is remarkable. Yeah. And we get along well. We have even before I came down here. You know, we knew each other through the International Society of Bassists, yeah. and it's a marvelous organization. 
So I'm yeah. really, really happy with what we've developed at the University of North Texas in the base area and the cooperation that we have across the fence of classical and jazz. Yeah, Lynn, when, when, when you're meeting, let's say you're meeting a bass player for the first time, or even like I come to take a lesson with you, let's say, let's say they already can play bass. Where do you, where do you start with somebody when, you know, you're teaching? Where do you, where do you go first? It depends upon the situation, but mm -hmm. let's say, let's give two scenarios. One, a one-off lesson. Someone contacts me and said, man, I'd like to take a lesson with you, you know? Mm -hmm. So here's the question. Are they calling me up to take a lesson with me because they've got questions about what I do and how I do it? So if that's the case, then I'll start with that. And I said, you're coming to me because you have questions about something I do. We'll start there. If they just want to take a lesson with me, then and they don't really have an agenda, then I'll say, let's have you play a little bit. I'll take out my notepad, I'll make some notes, and I'll make some observations, and then I'll offer some feedback on what I hear you play. Mm -hmm. And I always have to qualify that by saying, you might hear stuff from me that's completely different than what your teacher says. But that's okay. There's many ways to play bass. So yeah. it's very important to remember that, and you're old enough and mature enough to eventually make up your own mind but try all of these things that all these different people tell you and then make up your own mind at some point in time, you know? But yeah. if you're working with somebody, try what they're doing, unless what they're saying is not ergonomic and potentially might hurt your chops. Yeah. But I think more and more these days, people are being very aware of playing ergonomically. Yeah, and you know, you know who I feel like is huge on that is Paul Ellison. Oh, absolutely, here. through the and, robot and, stuff. Yeah, and when you know when I first, and I, I personally studied with Tim, but obviously I was with Paul all the time as well, and and they have two totally different modes of teaching. Um, where Tim is, I would say, more just kind of traditional to some extent, and Paul is definitely finding all these economical movements in the hand where you're doing different stuff, which is so cool, and then being able to blend the two. And then that doesn't even matter if we're talking about jazz or classical. You can put all that down for any music that you're playing. I agree with you. Yeah, and you. Know, but for me, um, you know, coming out of coming out of high school, I was just so serious about classical and wanted to be in an orchestra. And I decided I was going to do everything I could to try and go to Rice to do that, and then went. And it was awesome, but while in Houston, I just got so steeped in the jazz world here and jam sessions all the time and like really getting into it and then studied abroad and um, got to see so much jazz in Amsterdam. And I came back being like, ah, I think my heart maybe rests a little more in this music long term, but... Um, so I want to continue, but I want to have the best of both worlds. And unfortunately, I haven't gotten to have like a, I would say, a, just a jazz bass guide. We'll call it that. Besides, you know, recordings and all that. But I mean, an in-person thing. And one thing that I'm wondering regarding teaching again is, let's say somebody is just coming in you know, as a, as a freshman at UNT with you, what is the first thing that you focus on when they're starting to study? Incoming first year students take a class that we call jazz performance fundamentals for bass. There's a performance fundamentals for every instrument, but mm. specifically for the bass. And the first semester of that emphasis is on being a bass player learning how bass lines work, mm -hmm. writing bass lines, also classic pizzicato techniques based on things of the masters. Yeah. Things 
I, I really, the fundamentals. I mean, in our base world, most of the time, the gigs that we get, being able to solo is secondary, very secondary. To be in a great groover and playing clear bass lines with great time. So that's what I emphasize there in the beginning mm -hmm. within that class. We do learn technique. Same things on every instrument. You got to learn your fundamentals. In our world, it's scales and arpeggios and pizzicato techniques and some arco techniques. Fortunately, the program at North Texas, we have classical lessons required as well. Those happen simultaneously to this jazz bass class. So I tell the students that are new, so basically you have a group lesson with me two times a week and you have your classical lessons as well. Um, I have a very open door policy at North Texas. Literally, I'm in the main jazz hallway and if my door is open and I'm in there, you can come in and talk to me anytime. And I think Armin might know that that applies to everybody. You know, so a lot of people pop in, maybe because it's open. I was gonna get your opinion because you know you've been involved in the scene for so long, so you've seen it transform in a variety of different ways. What are some of the the staggering differences, maybe when you first got into the scene versus now? And maybe <clears throat> we can just talk about the education side of it, but also the. Uh, the gigging side of it, what do you think? Well, the gigging side, the most profound thing, obviously, is that the gig scene has crashed for yeah. all of the arts. Right. That's the elephant in the room that yeah. is painful to talk about and realize. And how it's going to get back is unknown at this point in time. I'm hopeful that it will. The thing that I'm really hopeful for is that everybody plays the game fair. Mm. It's been a challenge to make a living as an artist for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the people that pay us to do what we do have kind of got stuck on the value of what they pay us mm -hmm. for a very long time. Mm. When I was younger, I made a living playing jazz. I bought a house with help, obviously, from my wife working too, but playing jazz. Mm -hmm. I have taught in a jazz school. So I've made a life in jazz pretty much exclusively for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I'm spoiled rotten. I get to play music that I like by choice. I get to teach at one of the world's great schools with great students. I am spoiled rotten. So before the shutdown, you know, I was able to choose gigs, but I like gigging. I like playing. I like playing locally. I'm fine with that. I'm not so happy playing till 2 a.m. in the morning when I've got to get up and teach the next morning. So I'm not a big fan of the late night gig scene in the middle of the week for some of the clubs. But the truth of the matter is in Dallas, some of those late night people that hire jazz never paid enough anyway to do it. So I, there, I'm not going to mention any clubs, but some of them have been around a while and are still around. And they survived because they didn't pay musicians anywhere near their work. And you go in there and the place is packed. You're like, what? Mm -hmm. How come mm -hmm. you don't pay the musicians? Mm -hmm. You know, the drink prices have continued to go up, but the oh, musicians' man. pay is the same. Don't get so started. I hope that in the urge to play, that if people are going to play for free, that they're doing it at jam sessions at their friends' houses. Mm. Maybe they're doing house show. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But I hope that people don't just start playing for free in the restaurants or clubs just so they're so desperate to play. Well, I was going to say, and I didn't want to put words in your mouth, but it's like a, it's kind of a two way street because, you know, they try to keep a price level. You know, the, the venues will try to keep a price level. But also, if we don't negotiate the price level, it'll go wherever they want. <laughs> and I mean, yeah. and so it, it's tough. Um, 
it's probably not going to resemble the the scene's not going to resemble what it was once was and i'm sad to say that i have a lot of maybe some more uh dramatic opinions about that we won't get into but what about the education do you think well <clears throat> david baker said for many many years that the universities and the colleges are one of the great places to look for what's happening in the music right now yeah. so that's one of the things about education education has changed you know Mm -hmm. In at North Texas, we've always been training people to play jazz with the philosophy, if you want to be a jazz player, come to North Texas. Mm -hmm. Things are changing. As I said, we're adding commercial music. So to be a working jazz player was the goal. And now maybe things are evolving to become a working musician. But even though we've always trained people to be jazz players with the large ensemble experience they get combined with the small ex ensemble experience they get at North Texas, it's made our graduates extremely versatile. So we have yeah. people that move to major metropolitan areas like New York and they're trained jazz players, but they're first call Broadway people. And then you get other people that are trained jazz players that create their own wonderful individuality in music. And that includes people like Snarky Puppy mm -hmm. and Nora Jones. Yeah. yeah. Recent people. It's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like that, that being versatile is, especially today more than ever, just so important because fortunately and also unfortunately i'd say 80 percent of my gigs i'm playing electric bass right now and it's a lot of fun and it's pressed me really hard to do electric work that i didn't do before but at the same time because i'm playing a lot of more i would say a little commercially music uh -huh. um i'm i'm missing my upright vents more than I would like and there's just not a lot um, I feel like before the shutdown here in Houston there's a lot of straight ahead jazz and I feel like coming yeah. out of that right now it's less than I remember it being like for example I don't know if you've ever been to this place Cafe 4212 in Houston I don't know why I would expect you to, but it's this really old, long-standing club that had this Monday night jam session for, I don't know, I think he's, I think it was like 60-some-odd years. And um, unfortunately, that place is closed now because of the shutdown. And then you've got other places that are closed. But then you have other places that have opened up. And we, Armin and I have started a, a Monday night jam session kind of a, as an homage to that at a place where the owner it's kind of like a coffee and wine bar but the owner is from new york and he loves jazz and he right. wants to make it happen mm. and so there's there's hope there's hope all around i was gonna say this and lynn i don't know if you agree um but speaking on the industry side of things it's just been an observation of mine that it appears that there are structures of the biz or, or aspects of the system are clamping down more and more on um, music ownership or the licensing of music insofar as the percentage that artists are getting from their own work seems to be decreasing throughout the year somewhat instead of increasing. Um, you know, with even the advent of Spotify, we see that the paychecks of artists are, are not very good and yet the profit margins of spotify are exponentially growing in some instances now they were sued so they did suffer a little bit because of that um so what can the people do in your opinion in in order to negotiate a, a, or leverage themselves a little more and make sure they're not being totally taken advantage of if you want your music on spotify you have to go in on their terms Spotify has become 
a source for music for many, many people. I know so many people that own no music. They rely on digital and they rely on free digital or low cost digital. And for those musicians, that's shot your own foot right. to not support the product. Um, so that's sad. But what can we do? My projects on Bandcamp are the most profitable. Mm -hmm. Is it necessary to have a major label right now? I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. I've been on a lot of records. I've been on over 125 records. I think I've said that already and a lot of other things. Some of them were on major labels, but they're all still as a side person. Most, they are all buyouts. Back in the day, being a side person on a jazz record was a decent paycheck. Yeah. You know, the label would, even though it's small, would pay out front for the studio and for the side people on the record. Mm -hmm. And the probability that the leader was going to sell enough CDs or LPs to cover those costs and then make some profit was pretty high. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. Right. But now everybody self-produces and tries to find a place for their music. Even if it is on a label, then it's still often self-produced. And they expect us to self-produce and then put it on their label. Now, right. some labels sponsor, uh, give you a place for your label, but give you more money because you've done it out front. You've paid your own costs. You've paid your own musicians. So they'll give you a much higher percentage. So look for one of those labels. They're smaller labels, mm. boutique labels, but there are some out there that do that. And they have it in place to say, we have a stable of artists and some of them, some really great artists, you know, mm -hmm. great. It's nice to be a part of that. Yeah. I am sitting on several recording projects that I'm trying to figure out what to do with at this very time. You know, mm. I'm not sure what to do with them at this point in time. Talking to other people that I know all around the country, it still seems important to have physical product. And that means even a CD to send out for promotional purposes. Yeah. It still seems important to hire a publicist, which costs out the wazoo, but it, many people still feel that's extremely important because that's the channels that it is, yeah. you know? Mm. So maybe put it out yourself, put it on Bandcamp and hire a publicist, which will cost some money, but maybe you'll recoup. I don't know, you know? Almost nobody coming to North Texas as a new student owns a CD player. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them own turntables because it was kind of cool. I mean, Armin, you've been in my office. I have hundreds and hundreds of LPs. Yeah. I have a whole pile. Actually, you can probably see it. In, in that corner, that big blue cabinet mm -hmm. is full of CDs. Mm -hmm. You know? It's... And there are more elsewhere. But I collect music. I have for years and years. I love it. And I can't, I got a terabyte of music on my hard drive, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't know. I still believe in buying music and supporting artists. Always yeah. Uh, it's starting to sound like, uh, for lack of a better term, a certain kind of uh, business awakening needs to occur in the musicians for better or worse. And maybe that can start in part with the education institution um, where there can be business classes and there can be more discussion about these ideas, certainly because, uh, you know, yeah, we got to play the major third on the C7 chord and all that stuff, but Do then, we? yeah, but then I we, knew something was wrong, <laughs> but then Thanks. we find out we, th then we find out we don't actually have to play a major third and then it, that that's all a farce. And then we have to find out how to make money uh, off of it. So, 
Yeah, um, it's a two-way street. Well, I got- to follow up on that, we do now also, part of the new things at the University of North Texas, have a music business and entrepreneurship right. mm-hmm. class and program and, yeah. Have you heard of uh, how, what the the reception to that has been? It's incredible. Everybody Great. loves it. All the students are so happy to have it. Fantastic. You know, um, we have a, a new person overseeing that program now, the, the person that started it. But it's been pretty cool. They have, you know, a weekly class and people make presentations. And I'm not sure what will evolve with a new teacher in the fall, but. I think that will probably continue. That's yeah. awesome. Lynn, I was wondering, could you give us some sort of story that sticks out to you from just playing around with different people? Is there one story that might shock us? Mm. Or well, not, or just amaze us, who knows? Shock you? I don't know. I, I would uh, love to be shocked. <laughs> a crazy gig story was probably what we're all thirsting for here. Yeah. Like, I know you have a couple here. <clears throat> well, I'll say my best paying gig story. Okay. You were talking about the millennium earlier mm-hmm. and that craziness and all of that. Mm-hmm. Right. So I had a New Year's gig booked for New Year's Eve 1999 going into 2000. Mm-hmm. And it was the best paying New Year's gig that I'd ever had. But remember, I'm have always been spoiled being a jazz player on New Year's Eve. I know that some of my friends that are in these big commercial party bands have made money like that for years for New Year's Eve. But for me, it was a big deal. So uh, anyway, I got a call on the 30th saying don't worry we're with a big company but we're not going to be in the same place as what i told you so i will call you tomorrow morning and let you know where the gig is tomorrow night for new year's eve but don't worry things are cool you know it's a first class agency deposits made don't worry so got a call the next morning said hey can you meet me at 10 o'clock for breakfast the gig is canceled i have cash and i will buy you breakfast so oh, we're here we're listening that was yeah your video is gone but now you're back so that was a really really wonderful gig i appreciate the people <laughs> so much so know. it got so basically it just got canceled and you still got paid yeah in cash yeah, thank. So there's a good case for contracts and deposits right there. Right. Yeah. Take care of business. You know. Yeah. So yeah, I I can't claim that I'm the one that did that. I just <laughs> benefited from it. I was thinking that you were gonna say it was some sort of secret underground society <laughs> uh, gig where they give you the address right before it. No, I mean. Have you ever played anything like that? Any, I guess the closest I ever did was for back in the late seventies. I did do a private party for the Moonies cult. The Moonies cult. The Moonies. Yes. Cult. What is that? It was. Uh, I. I'm, the details are not with me, but it was a an international religious cult hmm. that was visiting college campuses and trying to recruit young people. And anyway, I was they, in. A, they led cults do that at colleges. <laughs> oh yeah, but anyway, uh, they uh, this was in Oklahoma. Anyway, I was in a in a band that got hired to play a private party, and. It was on some property that they owned out in the middle of nowhere. Mm. And I played a private party. That's the closest I've ever come. But I wasn't involved in the cult. I wasn't involved in the recruitment or anything. You know, they just. What about the Masons? 
have uh, any connection to the Masons? I have no connection. Oh, we've been, see- you know, it's funny. I've been seeing these gigs recently that have been happening in Detroit as well as Houston. And uh, they're all the same sort of setup. And they've also been uh, Miles Davis tribute concerts, but they've been uh, at the Masonic Temple slash at Mason own organizations and I'm I'm comparing them because I have friends here who've played it and I have friends in Detroit who've played it at the temple and I'm like wow this is really interesting and Miles Davis was a Mason which is pretty interesting the Masons are a service organization I don't think they're a cult at all but I don't know I've never been involved in it this is this is a religious cult yeah, um, yeah, yeah. you could google it and probably find out about it I don't know the details of it either. I'll get, I'll get, I'll get it. I'll get into, <laughs> the, I'll get into yeah. the reason I thought of the Masons is because you said Moonies, and I felt like it was just kind of you know the the more playful, sillier version of the Masons. I think it was it that was a take off on the person, the main uh, figure of the preacher or whatever that mm. ran this cult. The Moonies now. Lynn, we're not going to keep you for too terribly much longer because we know okay. you've got a whole life ahead of you. But one thing that we like to do is kind of just get general opinion about life from all of our guests. And wow, what the heck is that? Um, what, when you think about the meaning of life and you think about all the life you've lived, and what may come after or what may not can you give us that perspective what what is life well i think the answer to is 42. (laughs) Uh. well life for me has been a wonderful pursuit of art and family and sharing knowledge, community, friends, uh, other creative endeavors like cooking Mm -hmm. mean a lot to me. Um, Yeah, I mean, I do believe in the higher power, if that's what you're asking. Uh, Nature inspires me a lot, you know. Is that what you mean? Yeah. <laughs> Those are all fantastic. If, you know, if there's one thing that you could tell people, um, from, you know, just from your perspective about moving forth in the future, obviously we're in a rather tumultuous time energetically. Um, can you give us your, your sage advice about that? <laughs> well, reach out and communicate with people you know and love and if you need professional help it's out there too that's for sure Mm -hmm. Uh, we are so lucky as musicians that have music which brings me a lot of peace it brings me a lot of frustration too trying to learn to play it it's a never-ending process you know but I I have re-embraced that process you know, the truth of the matter is, in the COVID times, I was having a hard time. Mm. Mm-hmm. I didn't teach at school. I re- applied to be remote 100%. So I was a hermit for a long time. And going from playing many gigs a week, many gigs a year, to being stuck in my house with no gigs and no one to play with, it was a challenge for me to play the bass for a while. I mean, obviously, as a teacher, I had certain minimal maintenance that I had to do, but it took me a while to say, get off your butt and take advantage of this time and get your chops back together. So fortunately, I've been playing almost every day for quite some time now, but still it's exciting for me to get back and play a gig. I played a gig last night. Yay. (laughs) So I actually have two more gigs this week. You know, I'm excited. And one of them's a three hour gig. So. I'm very excited about that. Hope I still have the chops to play a three hours. Because uh, uh, most of the gigs that I've been doing, I haven't been doing that many, but most of them have been one hour, one-offs. Uh, 
Mm. You know? Wow. I, I did have one three hour gig and that was one of the earliest gigs. And yeah, I was like, wow, that's it used to be nothing. <laughs> yeah. But I did have to think about it, you know. Obviously I made it, but before yeah. I would never think about anything about that. I'd just go play. Not a big deal, you know. Yeah. And you know, to kind of piggyback off what you're saying, it just reminded me, last night I had the opportunity for the first time in a while to go see some friends play just on my way home. And uh, these are like amazing musicians here in the city. And I realized that I hadn't gotten to see live music here in the city in a little while because usually we're, we're also just doing something every night. And I came home and I was so energized and the music was so good and I was so wide awake, you know, at midnight and past midnight, whatever. And I was like, oh, I forgot that listening to the music live, not me just playing it, but actually going and hearing other people totally energizes me and actually revamps me. Agreed. It's something I'm missing out on, actually. I hear you. And I think I need to make a better, you know better leap towards going to see it more well but, it is very inspiring uh, last night's gig was really cool because there were two bands mm. uh, the first band was bazooka which is an incredible brazilian band here in the dfw area and then i played with another group led by rosanna eckert after that but it was really fun to be there early i came for the early show and stayed and played our set so it's really fun to get to see people and hang out with people that's awesome and I, and I saw students in person that i'd never seen in person because i've been gone for a year you know oh wow that was really cool yeah and to see them in person without masks because they were vaccinated and i'm vaccinated yeah pretty remarkable it is well the good news is that music unifies us Art unifies us, and that's one thing that we like to say on the podcast a lot. And at the end of the day, we're all one, and we always come back and unite. So, Lynn, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Really a treat. And um, it'll be out soon. And if I ever get to come up to UNT, I will let you know. Please, let's hang out. Talk some bass. That would be very cool. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. I, um, you know, this was a big honor for us, and this is going to go down as one of our best episodes. And let's uh, keep let's keep up. Thanks. Let's Indeed. keep in touch, and we'll hopefully see you very soon. Well, hopefully we can swing some jazz at some point. Oh yeah, I, I feel that it is in the in the foreseeable future. That'd be yeah. good. I love coming down to Houston. I mean, oh, I've please. played down there many times and have some really great friends down there and wow some incredible players if, if as soon as you do let us know there are so many places here that we could you know set something up yeah that's true you know mm -hmm. well, anyway so All you right. ask before we got on the air about plugging anything coming yes. up yes oh yeah so one thing i do want to plug is samuel colstein and sons is one of the big shops in new york Mm -hmm. They have had fundraiser during the COVID times of Musician Relief Fund, and they've sponsored some concerts. Barry Colstein, who is the son of Samuel Colstein, has expanded it to what he calls a living room series. And he asked me to play and record a half hour set to broadcast and that will be two weeks from yesterday so wednesday night it is on facebook live mm -hmm. with the colstein and sons are there so, if there's any links you can send us so that we can include those links in mm -hmm. the description of the uh, of our uploads please do that okay i'll do so that we, mm -hmm. i'll do that when we stop the recording perfect. and we can we can catch up on those things perfect Okay, but that's with a duet with Davey Mooney, and Fantastic. we had a wonderful time. Davey is a guitarist who has the whole history from early to really modern. I mean, he plays in Brian Blade's band, but he lived in New Orleans for a long time. He's got the whole history, 
And as far as a duet situation, since we got guitar and bass hanging out with you guys, you know what a special situation that can be when the connection is there and the ability to be there as an accompanist for the other person. Right. Mm -hmm. It's such a huge thing in a duet. And then to be there to have interaction in ways that are not possible in a larger ensemble. I had a yeah. ball with Davey. It was fun. We played together some. I also have in the can one of those recordings, as I mentioned, is a live set with Davey that I want to do a best of from several live sets that I've done and put something out. But that's my project, but I don't know when that's going to be. That's a bunch of different people. But the coal scene in Sons is happening there. And I've got to brag on my son, Aubrey, who is a wonderful audio engineer. And he recorded this. And Colstein contacted me and said, oh, my God, that's one of the best sounding bass recordings I've heard in a long oh. time. So it's like, wow, thanks. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Jeez. So he's going to look, sounds like he's going to have a bright future recording some legends coming up. Yeah, I hope so. Well, he did record Jeff Bradditch's last Bach project. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah, so he's getting yeah. it going. Got a steady church gig now. And doing some other stuff, working on some stuff for some film and Excellent. recording an audio book so, for someone else. So, yeah, the gigs are coming. He just finished school. And, Lynn, you know. real quick. I'm just yeah. remembering, what pickup should I put on my bass? Well, I can only talk about pickups that I use yeah. and are successful on mine. I've been a fan of the Realist Copperhead for a long, 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 long time. All right, that's what I have. But I also often use a microphone and sometimes just the microphone. I have a Shure Beta 56A wrapped in foam stuffed in my bridge that I've okay. been doing for a very long time. Actually, before I did that, this little microphone that I have here, which is a Countryman Isomax 2, that was my bass mic hmm. in the really? 80s, in the 80s and early 90s. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, but I'm happy with this other one a lot, but I combine it. But I just bought for my eminence bass a David Gage uh, sound clip, okay, which really helped the sound of my eminence a lot. The eminence, if people are not familiar with it, it's a travel bass. It's a hollow-bodied bass. It looks like a dulcimer on a stick. Mm. So, but it needs some help sonically with a good preamp. I was getting a good sound. I'm actually happy with it. It's an amazing playing instrument. I really like it. Obviously, it's not my 100-year-old bass, but mm -hmm. but it plays great, and it sounds good. And this pickup made it sound really good. So, I don't know. I'm a fan of that, you know? Good. That's good but to know. not all pickups work for everybody, you know? Right, yeah. But I have a... David Gage Copperhead realist on all my bases. Do you think, um, oh man, I'm sorry, just because you're here and I haven't gotten to ask anybody recently. Do you think, uh, if I've had mine on for just a long, long time, like over five years, that it would be time to just get a new one? Well, I have had them fail over time but mostly because of bumping into the wire. Okay. My microphone is held in the bridge and I'm going to hold on. Don't get dizzy. I'm going to move my everything so I can show you. This the base is over here. Bear with me a moment. <laughs> but it is plugged in. So. Oh, wow. You can see the microphone wrapped in foam, stuffed in the bridge. Wow. And I do have it running through. So. Yes. Oh, oh, that sounds good. Yeah, that's 
the <laughs> setup I use that for good. zooming and for recording. And last night was a live stream, so I blended the pickup with that microphone. Man, that sounded really great. And what strings are on your bass right there? Those are Zyx from Diadario light yeah. gauge. Are you getting like industry recording hacks and tricks from your son? <laughs> uh, yes, as a matter of fact. Uh, I, I yeah. figured, yeah, that'd be, that's uh, awesome. When, when I was having issues, I consulted him about what to do. Yeah. This morning, when before we started, when things were not working right, but I'm still baffled by that because yeah. the sound you said is fine now, but. Yeah. There was a yeah. mysterious buzz. The electronic fairies invaded somehow. Well, also the electronic fairies invaded us somehow, but it's, yeah. all, it's all good. Yeah, actually. So. Well, Lynn, once again, thank you so much. Everybody, this has been the legendary Lynn Seaton. Thank you Ace both. So good to see you.